Dead America, Miami. Dead America, the third week, book four. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter One. Day Zero Plus Seventeen. The sun pierced through the crack in the blinds, shining over Kenny's face. He stretched, muscles sliding beneath his dark skin. He groaned, covering his face with his pillow to avoid getting out of bed. But the battle was short-lived, as the diamond-encrusted custom-made watch on his nightstand bleated its loud alarm. The constant high-pitched beeping annoyed him enough that he slithered out from under his pillow and rolled over to grab the blue and black watch. He fumbled with it before finally turning it off. Come on, Kenny, he muttered to himself. Get your ass out of bed. Games may not be being played, but that don't mean you can slack off on your schedule. He set the watch back down on his nightstand and pulled himself up to a sitting position on the edge of the bed. After a moment, he finally shook the fog from his head and stood up, wandering over to the window. He peeked outside, watching the sun just coming up over the ocean. From his 27th floor penthouse, the South Beach view was more spectacular than most would have. This was a morning ritual for Kenny, a reminder that all of the hard work and sacrifice he'd made over the years had paid off. He took a deep breath, savoring the moment, and then headed out of the bedroom. He walked past the wall of photographs, Ken Wan, Kenny Morris in action on the football field. He walked past the shelves of awards he'd won, and even more photos of him receiving those awards. He walked past the giant 16 by 20 framed poster of him shaking hands with the pro football commissioner when he was first drafted. He strolled into the kitchen and opened up the fridge, greeted with a cool blast of air as he reached in to pull out some ingredients. He spent a few extra seconds enjoying the cold sensation on his warm skin. Extra thankful he'd upgraded to solar power when he'd bought his kingdom in the sky. He set some eggs, onions, mushrooms, and spinach on the counter, and then placed his seasoned cast iron skillet on the stove to warm up. He flipped on the coffee maker and the grinder, setting it to brew half a pot for him. While coffee hadn't ever been on the morning menu during football season, he decided to make an exception recently, considering that it was a luxury that would soon be gone for a while. Plus, he felt that it would have been a crime against humanity to let his hand-picked Kona Roast blend coffee go to waste. He hummed to himself as he whisked up an omelet and then slid it out of the pan onto a plate. He picked up the food and grabbed a steaming mug of coffee and then headed into the living room. He flopped down on the couch and picked up the remote for the TV, flicking it on. The screen went blue as there wasn't any signal for it to pick up. Hadn't been for a while. He used the menu buttons to access the hard drive connected to the smart TV. Okay, so what are we watching today? He asked brightly, flicking through several icons on the screen. He chuckled as the cursor highlighted a file called Kenwan Kenny Morris, Senior Highlights. Sure, why not? Been a while since I've revisited the good old days. He hit play and settled in, pulling the lift table top of the coffee table so that his breakfast raised up enough for him to comfortably access his food. A flashy intro scrawled across the screen, and a young Kenny Morris flexed in front of the camera, a wide grin on his face as jumping text bounced around, highlighting his name and position. Next was gameplay footage, showing him guarding a receiver that towered over even his six-foot-one frame as he ran a route. He was able to leap up for a jump ball, undercutting the receiver and intercepting the ball before landing hard on his back. Kenny winced. Yeah, that was pretty, but damn, that one left a mark, he said in between bites of his delicious omelet. He watched about 10 or so minutes of play after play of his young highlights, of interceptions, deflecting passes, and hitting players so hard they flew off their feet into the turf. He finished his food and pushed the coffee table back down, sitting back with his hot mug to watch the final play, his personal favorite. It was the conference title game, when he was pressed into punt return duty due to an injury to the regular guy. He caught the ball at his own 20-yard line and juked to the left to make the first man miss. 
From there, it was a downhill run through the defenders, clearly underestimating how fast he could move. One final head fake to the kicker, and he made it in for a touchdown to seal the victory for his team. As he threw his arms up in excitement, and his team jumped all over him in celebration, the flashy words came back onto the screen, bringing the video to a close. Man, can't believe I was so good, so young, he said, and took a long sip of coffee. Lucky for me, I've gotten better with age. He toasted himself and chuckled, and then grabbed his dirty dishes to go back to the kitchen. He chugged the last of his coffee and gave the dishes a quick wash, filling the drying rack. He wiped out the cast iron pan, making sure to oil it back up before hanging it back up on the wall. He cracked his neck. All right, he declared to his empty apartment. Time to get down to business. He walked to the other end of his 4,000 square foot apartment and into his own personal gym. It wasn't a massive setup, just a few machines and a full rack of free weights, but it was perfect for what he needed it for. He headed over to the speaker on the wall, flicking through the touchscreen to find a song he wanted. The mirrors along the wall rumbled with the deep bass, and he grinned at himself in the vibrating glass before heading over to the bench. He lifted some weights, losing himself in the burn and the music, and then went for a run on the treadmill. After working up a decent sweat, he did some curls in front of the mirror, and then set the weight he was using on the padded floor, flexing and letting out a deep scream to pump himself up. After his intense workout, he headed to the ensuite for a hot shower, which was another perk of solar power in the apocalypse. However, after seven minutes of standing under the searing hot bliss, his watch bleated its annoyingly loud alarm. Yeah, yeah, I know, time to get out, he muttered, and shut off the water. He dried off and rummaged through his dresser, selecting a pair of loose-fitting jeans and a tight t-shirt that hugged his rippling muscles. He couldn't help but check himself out in the mirror on the way by. Looking good, Kenny, he complimented his reflection. Looking good. Guess we should go say hi to the neighbors. He wandered down the hallway and wrapped his hand around the door to the spare bedroom, taking a deep breath before opening it. Inside was a disaster area. It was a far cry from the immaculate condition of the rest of his penthouse. The bed had been dismantled and shoved against the wall, all of the furniture end over end and moved off to the side. In the very middle of the room sat a king-sized mattress on the floor, surrounded by massive chunks of busted concrete. Kenny headed over, wrapping his hands around the handles on the side of the mattress, and dragged it to the side, revealing a three-foot-wide hole in the floor. Puffs of concrete dust flew up as he dropped the mattress to the side, and he looked down through the gaping maw of wood and concrete into the downstairs apartment. Within seconds of the noise, two zombies appeared below. There was an older male missing an ear, wearing a blood-soaked housecoat. The other had been a younger buxom blonde, with giant rotting tits and a bloody mouth. Morning, Jerry, Karen, Kenny greeted brightly. Hope y'all are doing okay on this lovely day. They groaned hungrily, reaching up with their sickly gray fingers. Luckily, there was a 10-foot ceiling, not to mention the additional two feet of building material in the floor. But their brains weren't firing anymore. Their only concern was that there was a fresh piece of meat dangling just out of their reach. Are you ready for our morning ritual? Kenny asked, as they continued to moan and reach for him. Thought so. He cocked his head and studied a massive chunk of concrete as long as his arm. He pursed his lips, thinking for a moment. Nah, that's too big for you guys, he mused. I can get two out of this. He headed over to the wall where a busted up nightstand sat on its side and picked up the large sledgehammer beside it. He lined up a shot and then brought it down hard on the center of the rock. It shattered into two, leaving gravel and dust between with a magnificent crack. He gently set the hammer off to the side and picked up one of the boulders. Man, I wish I had paid more attention when Aaron was giving me some throwing tips. He grunted as he stood up. He reeled back and then threw the rock down, aiming at Karen's head. He missed badly, only catching her shoulder. 
The zombified woman dipped a little to one side, but didn't stop her frantic moaning for a second. Okay, come on, Kenny, you can do better than that, he muttered to himself and picked up the other rock. He lined up his shot as carefully as he could, and then threw, this one smacking Jerry square in the face. There was an audible crunch as the zombie's nose shattered, and Kenny winced at the sound. He leaned over the edge, but the creature was still alive, despite his nose hanging from his face like a hunk of ground beef on a string. All right, all right, good game, y'all, Kenny said with a sigh. I'll get in a kill shot one of these days. Y'all have a good morning. He dragged the mattress back over the hole, muffling the hungry groans of the zombies below. It was partially a sound barrier, but also a failsafe in case the power went out and he happened to wander in there in the dark. He wasn't expecting to live forever, but he was damned if he wanted to go out falling through the floor. He checked his watch, now securely on his wrist. Nine o'clock, he thought. I got a little time before my calls. He headed out of the spare room, securing the door before heading out to his spacious patio. Most of the wall was made of iron bars, but on the one end, he'd had a glass wall installed so he could sit and watch the beach below. He could also see the South Point Pier, only 15 blocks away. He took a seat in front of the wall on a pillow he'd left there a few days before and stretched out his legs. He focused on the horizon first, blocking out everything but the sky and water, allowing himself to relax. He started with the muscles in his toes, focusing on them growing softer, soothing. He worked his brain up his calves, relaxing every part of his body in this way until he reached his head and closed his eyes, taking a deep, nourishing breath. Feeling centered and comfortable, glad to have the relief from the stress constantly thrumming beneath the surface of his normality, he leaned forward to look at the beach. On a normal weekday morning, he would have been able to see the white sand, only a few people dotted along the coast, getting ready to start their day. Now, however, there were so many zombies packed down there that he was lucky to see even glimpses of the beautiful sand here or there. Man, you know it's bad when you're longing for the spring break crowds, he thought bitterly. Not only were they smaller and more polite, but when a woman in a crop top walked by, you'd want to take notice rather than hold your breakfast down. He sighed and sat back on his pillow again looking to the south towards the pier. Every surface of land was just a never-ending sea of ghouls, stretching as far as his eyes could see. He took another deep breath, this one far less relaxing. He could only escape reality for so long before it came back to smack him in the face. Chapter Two Kenny walked into his office, a spacious room adorned with dark walnut bookcases and a large L-shaped desk. Against one wall was another awards case, holding trophies all the way back to his first peewee football participation trophy from when he was just nine years old. On his large desk, where a computer would normally sit, was a heavy-duty ancient piece of technology, a ham radio. It was a vintage World War II-era monstrosity, that took up the entire corner portion of the desk. He'd had it refurbished years back when he got his first pro football paycheck. In addition to the original structure, he'd updated the non-working portion with modern digital components. Most would have tossed such an old machine, but it had been Kenny's grandfather's who had cherished it dearly. It was a family heirloom, and he'd been happy to restore it to its former glory. Of course, once the apocalypse happened, he'd been extra glad he'd taken the time to honor dear old grandpa. Kenny sat down with a fresh bottle of cold water and flicked on the machine. The lights on the dial illuminated, showing him his frequencies. Next to it on the desk sat a clipboard with a list of names and frequencies running ten long, six of them crossed out. He ran his finger along the first name, Gerald, and dialed in the long string of numbers into the machine. He grabbed the microphone and leaned back in his seat. Hey, Gerald, you there, man? He asked brightly. It's Kenny down here in South Beach. He took a long swig of his water and waited. 
There was no reply. He sighed and hit the button again. Gerald, come on, man, it's been three days. Don't do your boy Kenny like that. He waited again for a long minute and finally shook his head. Three days of nothing from Gerald. That wasn't a good sign, and though he was reluctant to let go, he knew deep down that it was too late. He picked up his pen and crossed out Gerald's name. Only three left. Let's see who's next. He drew his finger down the list, stopping on Arnold. He dialed in that frequency and then sat back in his chair again. Yo, Arnold, it's Kenny, you there, bro? In less than a minute, the line came to life. Hey, Kenny, how's my South Beach brother doing? His voice was raspy and aged, sounding like a man that had spent years smoking two packs a day. Man, you know, just soaking up them rays, hoping for a pretty girl to walk on by, Kenny replied. Speaking to another human being made some of the tight muscles in his neck relax, and he let out a sigh of relief. He often spoke to himself just to hear a voice, but of course it wasn't the same as carrying on a real conversation. Oh yeah, Arnold replied, amusement lacing his tone. How's that working out? Kenny laughed. I'm gonna level with you, man, not too well. He grinned and took another swig of water. So how's my Wisconsin brother doing? It's cold as shit up here, man, Arnold replied. Normally I'd be complaining, but it seems to slow these suckers down another notch. Don't do much good if there's a hundred of them, but smaller groups, it really helps. Kenny cocked his head. In that case, send some of that snow my way. I'll get right on that, brother. Arnold replied, and then someone mumbled something far off in the background. He spoke back, muffled, as if his hand were over the microphone. Sorry about that, he said when he came back. Carol and the kids send their love to you. Well, you send my love right back at him, Kenny said with a smile. The hanging in there? The other man sighed. As good as can be expected given the circumstances, he admitted. Luckily, we've got a fenced-in portion of the yard, so the kids can at least go outside and build a snowman. Kenny imagined that, a vision of two young kids piling up giant balls of snow on one another, jamming a carrot nose in the center of the top and plonking a hat on top. Lazy big snowflakes falling from the sky, twinkling in the sun. It would have been a relaxing, beautiful scene, except he couldn't help but imagine a horde of zombies on the other side of the fence, reaching for the children with bloody fingers. You have him build one for me too, he said, and then took a deep breath. Hey, are Carol and the kids out of the room? Yeah, it's just us, man, Arnold said. Kenny ran a hand over his head. You heard from Gerald lately? There was a long pause. Been three days for me, came the reply. Tried him every few hours over the last couple, just nothing. I was afraid of that, Kenny said, resting his forehead on his hand. It was always a lot of fun to chat up. Arnold let out a noise of approval. Yeah, he said, surprisingly upbeat for how close to New York City he was. What was he, like 30 miles north or something? Kenny mused. Yeah, in a survivalist compound or so he claimed, Arnold confirmed. Kenny sighed again. Hopefully he's just having radio issues. He didn't believe it, but one had to have hope in these times, didn't they? He didn't think Arnold believed it either, but at least he'd put it out there, however slim a chance it might have been. One can hope, my man, his friend replied. One can hope. They sat in silence for a time, a somber moment. All of a sudden, the digital panel of the radio began to blink, and Kenny startled. What the hell, he muttered. Arnold immediately asked, you okay? Yeah, Kenny replied, shaking his head. Just, my scanner picked up a broadcast. The other man let out a whoop of excitement. Oh man, that's awesome, where's this one coming from? Kenny checked the frequency and then studied the chart he had on the other side of the machine. His brow furrowed. It's short range, he said. There was a short moment of silence as Arnold digested that. Well, hell, man, put my ass on hold, 
he declared. You may have a new friend. Or a way out, Kenny breathed. I'll be sitting right by my radio till you get back to me, Arnold promised. Kenny took a deep breath. Sit tight, brother, he replied, and then reached over to grab the microphone from the digital panel. He flipped the switch, and immediately the speaker came to life in the middle of a sentence. Coming around Key West, the voice said. I am headed up the coast towards Miami. Can anybody read me? Chapter Three Kenny sat stunned for a moment, and then his mind raced. The last thing he'd been expecting over two weeks into the zombie apocalypse was a ship coming by. Again, this is Captain Nico, and I am coming around Key West towards Miami. Can anybody hear me? Kenny snapped back into reality and hit the button on his microphone. I'm here, I can read you. Finally, the captain replied, relief in his voice. I was beginning to think I was the only survivor in the entire state. Who am I speaking to, please? My name is Kenny Morris, and I'm up here in South Beach, he replied, leaning forward in his seat. Excitement rippled in him, but he was afraid to have hope that this could be his way out, especially being so high in the sky. Good to meet you, Kenny Morris, came the jovial reply. I am Captain Nico of the vessel SS Live in the Dream. Kenny couldn't help but bark a laugh. If you're sailing the high seas and not stuck on land during this, you truly are living the dream there, Captain, he said, shaking his head. That is an understatement, my new friend, Nico replied. Tell me, Kenny from South Beach, how have you been able to ride out this mother of all storms? He took a deep breath. Well, I've been holed up in my penthouse ever since this nightmare began, he replied, rubbing his forehead. Got lucky that I had stocked up on food the week before, so I've just been barricaded inside trying to ride it out. A penthouse, huh? Nico mused, and then went silent for a moment. Wait a second. Kenny Morris with a penthouse in South Beach. Are you Ken Juan Morris, cornerback of the Miami football team? He smiled into the microphone. Yes, sir, that would be me. Nico let out an excited scream, sounding closer to a schoolgirl than a ship captain. Man, that is fantastic, he cried. I will never forget that interception you made against New York in the playoffs two years ago. They're driving to win the game, and you just leap up and take that ball out of the air like it's yours and nobody else's. I pulled my hamstring jumping off the couch when that happened. Never been so happy to have a limp. You were excited, Kenny replied, laughing. You should have seen us after the game. Nico let out a deep sigh of incredulity, and then went silent again for a moment. Wait a second, he finally said, drawing out his words suspiciously. If you really are Ken Morris, then why weren't you with the team when this all started? They were playing San Francisco, and I know the team always leaves early for their West Coast games. You are correct, Kenny assured him. The team was in San Francisco when this started. Just so happens I pulled a quad in practice the day before we were scheduled to leave. It wasn't too severe, but it was severe enough for me to be left behind. Nico clucked his tongue. Okay, he said slowly. I guess I can buy that, but something else confuses me. I'm happy to clear anything up for you, Kenny replied gently. The captain took a deep breath. If you're a multi-million dollar professional football player, why in the world do you have a ham radio? You've seen me play, Nico. You know I'm all about preparation, Kenny replied with a smile. I grew up in a small town in Alabama, and when I was a kid, we got hit hard by a series of tornadoes. Knocked the power out and tore up everything real good. I watched my father help coordinate rescue efforts with his ham radio, which really instilled in me the importance of being prepared for every situation. And as you can imagine, it's really paid dividends during this crisis. The captain let out a deep belly laugh. A superstar football player with a ham radio, he gasped, still laughing. I love it. He paused to catch his breath and then continued. So tell me. What is your long-term plan in this apocalypse we find ourselves in? To be honest, I have no idea, 
Kenny replied, shaking his head and flopping back in his chair. Just been sitting tight since this thing started. Nico clucked his tongue again. But I thought you were the king of preparation, he asked slyly. Oh, I've made preparations all right, Kenny assured him. The hallway outside my penthouse is swarming with those things, so I've already broken through the floor to the apartment below for an escape route. What kind of construction machinery do you keep in your penthouse that you could punch through wood and concrete? Nico asked, sounding dumbfounded. Kenny shrugged. Just have my sledgehammer. The captain paused. A sledgehammer? Why on earth would you have that? Because I do sledgehammer training, Kenny said. Nico paused again, and then chuckled. I have never heard of that. Well, when you grow up with no money, you get creative with your training, Kenny explained. I used to go out into the woods behind my house as a kid and cut through downed trees with my sledgehammer. Great way to build core strength. Nico laughed again. Well, this is why you're a professional athlete and I'm not. I usually hire people to take care of the trees I don't want anymore, or just move to a place without them. Well, lucky for me, it's been paying off, Kenny assured him. Or at least it will when I try to get out of here, he hoped. So you're wanting to leave then, Nico asked. Yes, sir, Kenny replied easily. Only have another couple weeks worth of food, and best I can tell there aren't any more boats in the marina. So I don't suppose you could let a brother hitch a ride, could you? Absolutely, my friend, Nico bellowed. Kenny Morris will always be welcome aboard any ship I command. He took a deep breath letting the hope grow a bit in his chest. How soon until you get to Miami? I figure I will be passing your location in two hours or so, the captain replied. But I can give you as much as three hours. I'm afraid I can't afford to stay in one place much longer than that, due to my fuel situation. I've marked some fuel stops along the way that should be pretty empty, and if I wait any longer for you, I won't be able to make it. Even with my engines off, the boat still uses some fuel to keep things operational. Kenny nodded. Understandable. Where do you propose we meet? Nico asked. Kenny sat forward, leaning an arm on his thigh. Are you familiar with the South Point Pier? He asked. Yes, I am, the captain replied, dragging out the last word a bit. But I don't think I can get too close to it due to the rocks running alongside it. Kenny shook his head. No worries, I just need you to meet me at the end of the rocks, he said. I wouldn't want to get into semi-shallow water anyway because of those things. You have a lot of them up there on the beach? Nico asked. Kenny sighed. It's like three spring breaks happening at once. I wish you the best of luck, my friend, the captain replied sincerely. It would be fun to have you on board. Kenny checked his watch and then set a timer for three hours. Just started my timer, he said. I will see you soon. Godspeed, Nico replied. The line went dead, and Kenny flicked the switch back to the vintage microphone. Hey, Arnold, you there? He asked. Yeah, buddy, came the instant reply. What did you find out? Kenny grinned. I got a ride. Chapter Four Kenny entered his bedroom, heading straight for the closet. He opened it and knelt down, pulling a blanket from the safe on the ground. He punched in the code to the digital lock, and it clicked open. He pushed aside the stack of important documents and moved over a few stacks of $100 bills. As if that's gonna do me any good now, he thought. Behind the money lay a black velvet case, and he pulled it out, sitting back on the carpet to open it. Inside was a pristine, gold-plated Desert Eagle pistol, with winding, intricate engravings adorning the barrel. Along the grip was his name and the number 13, his jersey number. He ran a hand over the beautiful piece. He'd never been a gangster, despite what some assumed about him. He wasn't even that much of a shooter. Outside of the day he'd received this as a gift from a local rapper, he'd never even taken the thing out of its case. Hope this thing is actually functional and not just a display piece, he said to himself, 
picking up one of the two bright gold magazines. He turned the gun over and fumbled it open, taking longer than he wanted to admit to get the clip in. He cocked it and turned it over in his hands, making sure it was loaded. I'm gonna have to be right up on these things if I'm gonna hit anything, he thought with a sigh. He set the gun down and turned back to the safe, pulling out a solid black leather holster that had come with the gift. Bright red embroidery on the outside boasted A dollar sign R, the name of the rapper who'd gifted it to him. He hooked the holster onto his belt and then clipped the gun securely into it, slipping the spare magazine into his other pocket. What else do I need? He muttered as he got to his feet, kicking the safe closed with his foot. What else? He cocked his head and then reached up onto the top shelf of his closet, finding a small LED flashlight, as well as a worn six-inch knife in a tattered sheath. He smiled at the old piece. It had been his father's blade once upon a time. He'd carried it with him everywhere he went, and it came in handy for all kinds of things. Whittling, carving, peeling apples, prying things. His father always had the thing in his hand when Kenny was a kid. Well, Pops, if it was good enough for you, it's good enough for me, he said, and attached the sheath to the opposite side of his belt. The flashlight went in with the magazine, and he took a deep breath, looking around his bedroom. It was probably the last time he would ever be in there. The feeling was surreal, and washed over him as if he were momentarily drunk. He swallowed hard, and then steadied himself before walking out, heading into the kitchen. He pulled a bottle of water from the fridge and downed the whole thing in a single go, gasping for air afterwards. He rolled his neck and bounced from foot to foot, psyching himself up for the great escape he was about to attempt. He went into the spare room, closing the door behind him, and then focused on the mattress. He knew he'd have to move as silently as possible to prevent his neighbors from greeting him at the hole. Out of the corner of his eye, his sledgehammer gleamed. He smiled. Oh yeah, he thought, that's coming with me. He picked it up, holding it with pride before kneeling to grab the custom chain he'd had made for it. He clasped each end of the chain to the metal loops welded to the handle, and then slid the hammer over his shoulder and back for easy transport. It wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world, but the thing held a lot of sentimental value, and if there was one thing he was actually good at wielding, it was the sledge. He had a gut feeling that it would come in handy, and he didn't want to leave it. He wrapped his fingers around the mattress handles and very gently lifted it, standing it up on its end against the far wall. With the hole revealed, he crept to the edge of it, not seeing his neighbors in the immediate vicinity. He knelt and felt around the jagged edge of the hole, finding a solid piece of rebar. He yanked on it to make sure it was secure enough to hold his weight, and took a deep breath. He slowly lowered himself into the hole, gripping the bar tightly. He dangled for a moment, still about four feet from the ground, even with his arms extended, and then breathed in sharply before letting go. His trainers hit the hardwood floor with a thud and a high-pitched squeak. Jerry whipped around from the kitchen, staggering around the island, groaning loudly. His nose still hung from his face, dangling back and forth like a pendulum. Kenny quickly unslung the sledgehammer from his shoulder and raised it over his head, bringing it down hard into his neighbor's chest. The force of the blow caved in Jerry's breastbone, sending him to the ground. Kenny wasted no time bringing the hammer down onto the zombie's face, sending that dangling nose right back into his skull. Sorry, Jerry, he thought shaking his head. Wish it didn't have to end like that, brother. He swallowed hard as he looked at the lifeless corpse, but he didn't have time to ruminate as the sound of moaning echoed behind him. He whipped around to see Karen, hair matted and askew, arms outstretched in the living room. She was stuck behind the couch, attempting to walk through it to get to him instead of going around. Her roomy eyes practically glowed as she fixated on him like a dog staring at a treat. He sighed and headed for her, making sure to stay in the center of the couch so that she wouldn't veer to either side. He brought the hammer down from high, demolishing her head like Gallagher with a watermelon. 
Her skull smushed into her shoulders, and her body crumpled to the ground in a heap. Kenny slung his trusty weapon over his shoulder, already glad he'd brought it with him. One floor down, 26 to go. Chapter five, floor 26. Kenny positioned himself against the door to the apartment, looking through the peephole into the hallway. He could see a lone zombie right in front of the door facing to the left, but he couldn't see too far down either direction despite the fisheye curvature of the lens. It looked like there were a few poorly spaced out emergency lights out there, but at least they were functioning since the main power to the building was out. Okay, one in front, he thought, stepping back from the door. Closest stairwell to the left. You got this, Kenny. He took a deep breath, clenching and unclenching his fists, bouncing from foot to foot. It was just like he would have psyched himself up before a ball is snapped on the field. In his head, he visualized a football being hiked to the quarterback, and the image and feeling he conjured was enough to get him moving. He threw open the door and grabbed the hallway zombie by the scruff of the shirt, jerking it back into the apartment. He slammed the door quickly, trapping the surprised ghoul inside. The noise attracted the attention of a trio of creatures up the hall, in the direction of the stairwell. He froze for a moment, trying to make a snap decision whether he should turn and make a run for the stairs on the opposite side. Moans echoed from behind him, and he glanced over his shoulder at a cluster of zombies guarding that end as well. Looks like I'm playing through, he thought, and took a deep breath, pulling the sledgehammer back from his shoulders. He sprinted towards the rotted triad, lined up in a staggered formation of about three to four feet apart from each other. Kenny used his speed to close the gap quickly, knowing if he took them on one at a time, he'd have a better chance. He held the hammer like a knight would use a jousting lance, straight out in front of him. The business end slammed into the lead zombie's chest like a battering ram, giving a satisfying crack as the creature's chest caved in. The impact sent it flying back into one of its friends like a rag doll, knocking them both to the floor. Instead of sticking around to finish them off, Kenny opted to leap over the writhing corpses, landing just in front of the third zombie. As it lunged for him, he sidestepped it just as he would a potential tackler on the field. He chucked it aside with such force that it left a dent in the wooden paneled wall. He couldn't help but think that maybe he'd picked a cheap building to buy a penthouse in, considering the ease of the damage. A scattered and panicked thought as he sprinted towards the stairwell. He moved like the wind, the obstacles now out of the way, but forced himself to stop just short of the door. Calm down now, buddy, he chastised himself, huffing as he stared at the door handle. Don't get too excited now. You know what happens when you go overboard with things, you get beat. Just like your first college game where you thought you had it, but ended up whiffing and watching from the ground as your man scored a touchdown. Now do this right, and you'll get out of this. He steadied his breath as he slowly opened the door, keeping his hand tight around the handle, in case he needed to slam it shut on any surprises. Thankfully, nothing grabbed at him as he opened it, and his hammer arm relaxed a touch. As he stepped into the stairwell, he glanced back at the zombies he'd barreled over, seeing that they were finally finding their footing again. He slipped onto the landing, closing the door behind him as quietly as he could. Unfortunately, the click was so loud that it echoed through the tall corridor. He winced at the noise and didn't have any time to mentally berate himself before the moans began. They echoed around, but it seemed to mostly be coming from below, with several from above as well. He leaned over to look up and saw a dozen or so monsters up on the landing above him. No time to think. He tore down the stairs, taking them two at a time hoping to put as much distance as he could before he had to start fighting. He paused on the next landing as a body careened down the center of the stairwell, having fallen off in its undead clumsiness. It bounced off of the railing, slamming from side to side as it plummeted to the ground below. He continued running until the groans became deafening in their closeness. He skidded to a stop on a landing and noted the veritable dozens of zombies bustling over each other to try to get up to him on the next flight. 
He contemplated taking them on, figuring he could just shove them down. But he didn't know how many were really behind and how far down they went. He turned to the hallway door. Getting closer, he thought, as he noted the large 23 on the sign. He threw open the door without thinking, and as soon as he stepped into the hallway, a pair of bloodied, squishy hands reached for him. He attempted to leap back, but the thing got a death grip on his shirt and jerked him into the hallway, the stairwell door slamming shut behind him. Kenny twisted away, bracing his back against the wall to avoid lurching over. The zombie was huge, his own height, and easily 220 pounds. He braced a hand against its chest, struggling to keep it at bay, while he attempted to get his knife from its sheath with his other. The creature snapped at him, teeth gnashing, crimson spittle flying everywhere as it snarled with hunger. Moans echoed from beyond, and Kenny looked past the ghoulish face to see two more friends lumbering towards him. His stomach tightened as he tried to protect his tender flesh. He knew he was strong, but nowhere near strong enough to force this gigantic, rotted dude back into them. Need to get creative, he thought, and then threw his body into a spin. He used the weight of the clumsy beast as an anchor and slammed it into the wall with the force of it. He applied as much pressure as he could to keep it there using the momentum of his spin to kick his foot into the chest of the first incoming creature. While he innately winced at his bad form, it did the job, and the force of the blow was enough to knock the zombie back into its friend, sending them both tumbling back to the floor. With a brief window to strike, Kenny managed to pull his father's knife from its sheath and stab the big boy right through the eye. He tore himself free of the nasty grip, and before the rotund zombie even hit the ground, he had his sledgehammer in his hand. He brought it down hard in quick succession to put an end to the two writhing bodies on the ground. With the immediate threat eliminated, he took a breath, looking up and down the hall, but froze as the stairwell zombies began pounding on the door. He slung his trusty hammer back over his shoulder and bent down to grab the knife from its gooey target wiping it on the zombie's shirt before sheathing it. Okay, gotta get to the other side of the building, he thought. Nothing to it, you got it, buddy. He cracked his knuckles, moving as slowly and quietly as he could to the corner. He didn't know what would be over there, but he hoped whatever there was hadn't been spooked or alerted by any of the noise, not to mention the now constant banging from the stairwell door. The hallway was just dim enough that he had to strain his eyes as he walked, and he shook his head. The building owner should have sprung for the solar package, he thought, though he was unable to truly distract himself with humor. The hallway was long, reaching a central lobby area where the elevator was, three equally long corridors running in each cardinal direction. Kenny peered down each one, but could only see about halfway down with the crap emergency lights. Moans echoed from the ones to the left and right, but thankfully the one with the stairwell was the one straight ahead. Creatures staggered out of the darkness, and he gave them a wave. Guess that's my cue to get moving, he said, and took off at a jog. Groans erupted ahead of him, and he skidded to a stop, drawing his hammer again. He blinked rapidly at the dozen or so creatures packed into the relatively narrow hallway. Think, man, think, he thought frantically and looked around. He stared at the apartment door next to him and frowned, but then back over his shoulder, where the other two groups of zombies fought past each other to get around the corners to him. He shook his head in frustration and turned to the door, smashing the handle with the hammer. It partially opened, but was still hung up, he could almost feel the zombie's rotted flesh grazing him, and he gave a loud grunt as he swung harder, this time successfully breaking open the door. He rushed inside and was met with a family of zombies. Oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me, he thought, at the sight of blood covering almost every surface of the place. A young woman struggled to crawl towards him from the kitchen, enough flesh missing from its legs that it couldn't stand anymore. The parental units were the most put together and staggered towards him from the living room, a young boy gasping and gargling from the bathroom 
arms outstretched. Kenny sprinted forward, using his shoulders to knock the parents apart. He vaulted over the couch and threw open the patio door, leaping out onto the balcony and shutting it behind him. He backed away from the glass, watching the family turn to approach his new prison. The hallway zombies flooded into the apartment behind them, quickly filling the living room with a mosh pit of the dead. Well, now what, Kenny? He asked himself, running a hand over his head. He turned around, looking over at the balcony next to the one he stood on. He sighed. All of a sudden, starving to death in a few weeks isn't sounding so bad. He inched to the edge of the balcony and made the mistake of looking down. He stepped back, dizzy from the height, and closed his eyes for a moment, trying to steady himself. Eight feet, he murmured, slitting his eyes to focus on the balcony across from him. It's just eight feet. I can do that easy. He stuck a hand out to feel the breeze direction, hoping it would be on his side. He would just have to hope the wind would cooperate. Never know when a gust is gonna come along and ruin your day, he said, and scrubbed his hands down his face. He took off the hammer and tossed it across. It landed with a thud and clatter on the concrete on the other side, and he bounced on the balls of his feet, shaking out his hands. The zombies behind him reached the door, slapping the glass with their dead hands. Ready for a show? He called over his shoulder. Ken Juan Morris, making the eight-foot leap from the death line. He clambered up on top of the railing and bent his knees like a frog about to hop. Before he could overthink it, he pushed off with a grunt. As if Mother Nature were giving him the finger, a gust of wind smacked him in the face, blunting his forward progress. He threw his hands out, reaching to grab something, anything. His arms went right through the slats in the railings, smacking down on the hard concrete, and he scrabbled for a moment before managing to get a good grip on two of the bars. He took a deep breath, locking his shoulders, and heaved himself up, reaching up with one hand to grab the top of the railing. After making sure he had a solid grip, he moved his other hand and then swung his legs up and over. He tumbled onto his back, but was thankful for hard concrete, as opposed to plummeting to an early grave in the parking lot 23 stories down. Kenny laid still for a moment, catching his breath, and then slowly peeled himself off of the floor into a sitting position. The patio faced away from the beach, towards the rest of South Beach and downtown Miami. He was too far away to get much detail in the high rises of downtown, but there were definitely plumes of smoke rising from the city. Six, maybe eight. It was difficult to tell because many were twisting together into giant smokestacks. It was almost mesmerizing, seeing the world burn like this, knowing it wouldn't stop until the fire got tired. He startled at the sound of shattering glass, heart stopping. He relaxed a touch when he realized it was the patio door from the balcony he'd just jumped from, and turned to watch the zombies cluster outside. Y'all couldn't resist the view either, huh? He asked, shaking his head and chuckling. Take a good look, because you'll never see anything like it again. He paused for a moment, sobering at the insinuation. He probably wouldn't ever see anything like it again either. Chapter 6, Floor 23 Kenny caught his breath for another minute, dreading getting to his feet to face what was surely to be just another shit show. He wanted to stay positive, but he'd only made it three floors and barely escaped with his life. Come on, buddy, get the hell up, he thought, and peeled himself off of the concrete floor of the patio. He readied his sledgehammer and wrapped his hand around the door handle, taking a deep breath before opening it. He waited for a moment, straining his ears, and then stepped inside. Nothing jumped out at him in the immediate vicinity, so he held his hammer with both hands and let out a whistle to see if that would draw anything out of the woodwork. To his surprise, nothing appeared. About time I got a break, he muttered, and then headed across the cavernous living room. His steps echoed on the hardwood floor, trainers giving off little rubbery squeaks. He crept to the front door and stared out the peephole, and his heart immediately sank. 
It was wall-to-wall zombies out there, and that was just what he could see. Doesn't look like I'm going that way, he thought bitterly, and then retreated back out to the patio, taking in deep lungfuls of air. The zombies on the balcony he'd vacated earlier moaned, arms reaching for him over the railing. So what would y'all do in my situation? He asked them, putting his hands on his hips. He paused, cupped a hand to his ear, and pretended to listen to the undead monsters. Yeah, that's not a bad suggestion, but I don't think that's gonna work out for me. He looked over the edge at the dizzying distance of the ground and let out a long sigh through his teeth. He stepped back and secured his hammer back around his shoulders. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go all daredevil. He shook his head, looking to the sky for a moment and clucking his tongue at what he was about to do. He climbed over the railing, turning around to face the building as he secured his shoes on the outer lip. Get the penthouse, my realtor said. He grunted as he began to lower himself down. It's a beautiful view, he said. He managed to get a good grip on the edge of the concrete before slowly letting his feet dangle down. It'll only increase in value, he said. He looked down to gauge his fall, the same distance that he'd had to go when he jumped down into Jerry and Karen's apartment. Only this time, he had to fall at an angle, so definitely more difficult. Kenny growled. If that realtor ain't dead, I'm gonna smack him when I see him. He began kicking his legs forward to build momentum, like a kid swinging on the monkey bars. He counted down silently, and then heaved forward, letting go. He was only in the air for a split second, but it was easily one of the most terrifying moments of his life. Falling from a 23rd floor balcony was nerve wracking, even with being able to see the landing spot below. He hit the concrete and stumbled forward, managing to catch himself before face planting. He took a knee, leaning on it with his thick arm to catch his breath, and then startled at a loud smack on the patio door. He looked up, seeing a lone zombie banging on the glass from the inside. It was small and lean, maybe even a teenager, and didn't have any visible wounds. Must have been infected from the get-go, Kenny thought, shaking his head. It was almost worse to see one without any bites or fight marks. The zombie looked more like a ghost than anything else, just gray with silvery eyes. Poor dude never had a chance. He pulled on the door, but it didn't give. Locked. Paranoid even this high up. He shrugged at his reflection in the glass. Of course, I'm on the outside looking in, so maybe it was warranted. He pulled his sledgehammer from his back and reared back, swinging hard. The glass cracked, but didn't shatter. He stepped to the side and swung it like a baseball bat, lining it up so that it went straight through the glass and smacked the zombie in the chest on the way in. He let the hammer go, leaving it to its momentum, stepping back so that he didn't get any of the falling glass on his skin. The zombie flopped around on the floor for a moment and then regained its footing. Kenny reached for his knife, but then stopped, a smile curling his lips. As the corpse crossed the jagged threshold, he grabbed it by the front of the shirt and the belt buckle. He lifted the groaning creature over his head and hurled it off of the balcony. He peered over the edge, watching the undead monster flail its limbs as it plummeted to the ground below. It hit the asphalt and liquefied, got spraying across the ground like a 4th of July fireworks display. Closest thing I'm getting to entertainment today, he declared, and saluted the fallen zombie before heading inside. He picked up the hammer and shook it, making sure there were no errant glass chunks attached. He made his way to the front door, sweeping his eyes across the apartment as he went to make sure there was nobody else skulking about. Once clear, he stepped up to the door. He peered through the peephole, this time seeing nothing. It was a welcome sight, but he was still wary. Let's see how this goes, he thought, and slung the chain over his shoulder, drawing his knife in case there was a close encounter. He inched the door open and peeked out, slowly poking his head into the hallway to look both ways. It was thankfully empty, but he didn't want to press his luck, so he closed the door as carefully and quietly as possible behind him. The click of the latch, while quiet, 
still boomed in his ears, and he stayed stock still, listening as hard as he could for any potential moans. Still nothing. He moved quickly and quietly down the hallway, still on edge despite the relief of no undead groaning in the distance. He reached the stairwell, the one he'd been trying to get to on the 23rd floor, and wrapped his hand around the knob. He readied his knife and opened the door just a hair, ready to slam it shut if need be. When he met no resistance, he opened it a little more, and it creaked a tiny bit, making him draw in a sharp breath and freeze. There was nothing in his immediate vicinity, and he poked his head into the stairwell, looking up and down the flights before him, seeing nothing. Guess everybody was going up the other set of stairs, he thought with relief, and stepped into the stairwell. He tried to close the door as quietly as he could, but the latch echoed in the tall corridor, and he winced at the sound. Thankfully, the moans sounded distant, as if they were very far below, and from what he could tell, there were none above. Doesn't look like I'm getting all the way down, but this should shave off a good chunk. Kenny descended the stairs, moving as quickly as he dared without making too much noise. The lighting was just as bad in there, so it was difficult to see much further than a landing or two ahead. He stopped at every set to look down and make sure he wasn't running right into an onslaught. Several floors down, the moans were significantly louder, along with the rhythmic pumping of footsteps shuffling on the concrete. He readied his sledgehammer, sheathing his knife, and moved cautiously, wanting to squeeze every last floor out of his journey, but also not wanting to be so eager it would lead to an early grave. He stood at the top of the 11th floor flight, finally seeing a mass of rotted flesh staggering up into the light. Guess this is my stop, he muttered, and turned to the door. This time, instead of throwing it open, he knocked on it, and almost immediately received banging from the other side. Guess the 12th floor is my stop, he corrected, and tore back up the stairs. He knocked on the door loudly, and then waited. After what felt like not long enough and too much all at the same time, nothing happened, and he didn't want to wait any longer for his pursuers to make it up to him. He opened the door a crack, seeing nothing but a mostly empty hallway, with just a lone zombie about 20 yards away. It stood, dumbly staring up at one of the emergency lights, as it flickered on and off. He stepped into the hallway, letting the door swing shut behind him, and swung the sledgehammer just as the ghoul turned towards the noise. He bonked it on the top of the head, the corpse crashing to the floor, twitching. Once down, Kenny froze and listened hard for any other moaning or movement. There was nothing, aside from the moans echoing in the stairwell, louder and louder, as they tried to follow him through the closed door. He made his way to the center lobby area with the elevators, and pulled out his flashlight. He shone it down each of the other three hallways, revealing only a couple of zombies down one of them. He took a deep breath. Come on, buddy, let's finish him off so you have time to think. He returned the flashlight to his pocket and tightened his grip on the sledgehammer, waltzing down the hallway as if it were any normal day. The sounds of hammer versus shredded flesh weren't anything normal, but at least he was able to make quick work of them and return to the lobby. All right, walk it through, he said to himself, voice more confident now that he was sure he was alone. Stairs aren't an option, and if you ever go out on a patio above the second floor again, I'm gonna smack you silly, so that's out. He looked at the elevator and clicked his tongue, puffing out his cheeks and letting out a deep breath. Guess we're hitting the lift. Just gotta hope it's on another floor. He stepped forward and tried to jam his fingers between the doors to try to pry them open, but they were stuck fast. He pulled his knife and wedged it in between, cracking them open just enough that he could get his fingers in. He heaved a grunt as he pulled, straining his muscles to pull, and then finally the doors gave in, rolling open. He rested his hands on his knees, elated to see an empty shaft in front of him. He pulled out his flashlight and leaned in, shining down to see the car several floors down. That doesn't look like the bottom, but it's a lot closer to the bottom than here, he murmured, and clicked off the flashlight, 
putting it back in his pocket. He held on to the side of the door and reached for the large cable running to the car below. He pulled the thick cord to him and then pushed off, wrapping his arms and legs around it like it was a firehouse pole. He swung out into the center of the shaft, gripping tight until the swaying subsided before beginning his descent. He loosened his grip a little, sliding a few feet, and then tightening to stop his momentum. He did this a few times so that he wouldn't pick up too much speed and slam down into the elevator car. When he finally reached the bottom, Kenny gently stepped off of the cable, shaking out his hands and loosening his limbs from the descent. He looked around, noticing that the car seemed like it was stuck between floors. The doors in front of him were a few feet above the top of the car, the floor at waist height. All right, let's see what we got, he thought, and knelt down to the trap door in the top of the car. He found the release and popped it open. The stench slapped him in the face like a wet blanket, and he jerked back, covering his mouth and nose. There were easily a dozen zombies packed inside, writhing together in a big mass of rotted flesh. Putrid hands reached up to him, the moans and groans growing excited by the square window of fresh meat above them. Sorry, y'all, but I think I'm gonna get off here, he said, and waved at the excited corpses before shutting the trap door. He secured it, regardless of the fact that they wouldn't be able to open it inside. He pulled his knife and wedged it between the doors in front of him, digging his fingers between to pry them open like he had upstairs. They opened a lot smoother than the last ones, rolling back by themselves after the initial shove, which was good because he needed to back up straight away. Eight zombies stood in the hallway, quickly turning towards the noise, mouths opening with excited shrieks and moans. He scrambled to sheathe his knife and pull the sledge from his back, eyes wide as saucers. The first one staggered forward and fell into the shaft, tumbling down onto the elevator car. Like lemmings, a few more fell in after it, and Kenny frantically played whack-a-mole, smashing their heads as quickly as he could before they could get back up. Another ghoul made to step off of the platform, and he quickly thrust his hammer up, catching the falling zombie in the gut and using the momentum to flip it over his head. The corpse flew and smacked into the cinder block wall, tumbling headfirst down the shaft, sliding between the elevator car and the side until its waist. The legs stuck out of the space, wriggling all over the place, but at least the business end was secure. Kenny turned and brought his hammer back into striking position, and a fallen zombie managed to grab his ankle, pulling its gnashing teeth closer and closer to him. He brought the hammer down on the back of its skull and shook his foot fiercely to dislodge the tight-gripped hand. A few more stumbled to their feet as two more fell into the door, the cluster between him and his escape growing thicker. He held his hammer out like a lance again, shoving it into the lead zombie's chest, giving a hard shove to send it back into the other three like a battering ram. The gap between the elevator car and the wall was bigger on that side, and the quartet of dead friends crumpled into the space, plummeting into the chasm below. He threw the hammer at the next one's knees, tripping it right at the door. He lunged forward and grabbed it by the back of the shirt as its chest hit the floor, and yanked it down into the gap, cracking its skull on the edge of the car on the way down. Kenny took the brief window of opportunity to haul himself up into the hallway, rolling quickly to take out the legs of the last zombie. It fell face first into the ground, and he jumped to his feet, giving it a swift kick to send it sprawling into the shaft on top of its other friends. He looked side to side down the hallways, seeing no other immediate threats, and scrubbed his hands down his face to catch his breath. He leaned over, mind reeling with the fact that he very closely became a mid-morning snack. He stared down at the zombies on the elevator car, all of them having righted themselves and clustered at the door, unable to climb back up. They groaned and reached for him, the sad song of hungry corpses unable to get to their meal. I was a whole lot closer than I would have liked, he told them, and straightened up. He looked around and located his sledgehammer, picking it up and holding it in his fists at the ready. He studied the signs on the wall. 
although fourth floor is definitely closer than I thought I'd gotten, he said. Two arrows pointed in either direction, the left reading amenities and the right reading model apartment. He took a deep breath and headed left. Let's go see what this place has to offer, he murmured, leaving his groaning dead buddies to cry after him. Chapter 7, Floor 4. Kenny headed for the door leading to the main amenity area. He looked through the small glass panel, noting that the hallway was clear. He slipped through, closing the door silently behind him, and looked down the walkway heading to the end of the building. To the right, there were a couple of doors that led to the business center, as well as a huge conference room. To the left was an open wall, so that people could look out over the main lobby of the building. He checked the business center first, checking to make sure there was nothing inside. He also made doubly sure that the doors were secured, just in case something was hiding that he couldn't see. The last thing he wanted was for a zombie conference to come shambling out to eat him while he lined up his escape. He headed back to the left side and stepped up to the railing overlooking the lobby. Below was the huge lounge area, with couches and recliners that stretched out another 15 feet before another railing on the third floor. And then the main lobby was beyond that took up the remaining two floors. Part of the lobby was obscured by the giant balcony on the third floor, but he could still see the front doors leading to outside, and none of what he could see was good. There were hundreds of zombies roaming about, many staggering in through a shattered front window on the far side, Kenny stared at it and scrubbed his hands down his face in disbelief. So much for walking out the front door, he thought, and took a deep breath to try to steady himself. He began to pace back and forth, tapping on the chain across his chest. Thank Kenny, how the hell are you getting out of here? He muttered as he moved. Parking garage is out since it's underground. These things are bad enough in the daylight. The back exit leads straight to the beach, and I'm not about to be trying to outrun these things on sand. What else is there? He wrung his hands. Garbage chute, maybe? Nah, with my luck, that trash can will be sealed up tight. Not risking that. He continued to pace, and then a big green sign caught his eye. He stopped moving and stared at the arrow boasting the word, pool, first floor. A smile grew on his face, the first one in what felt like forever, as his chest leapt with hope. There you go, private staircase to the pool, he said to himself. It's on the side of the building and looks out towards the street. Get down there, hop the fence, and you're on your way. He jogged to the end of the hall, turning towards the door to the pool stairwell. He slowed down and peered through the glass door, his stomach immediately sinking at the sight of dozens of zombies inside. Would be real nice if one of these staircases would come up empty, he groaned, and turned back, heading to the railing with his tail between his legs. He looked over the edge, noting the ten-foot drop to the floor below. Just to the left, there was a large couch directly underneath the balcony. He pursed his lips, staring down at it, and then shook out his hands. Yeah, I can make that. He shook his head as he once again climbed over a railing lowering himself to dangle off of the side like a madman. He braced himself before letting go, dropping onto the couch, and bounced a bit before landing with a dull thud on the carpeted floor. He quickly pulled his sledgehammer from his back, whipping around in a circle just in case there had been anything out of sight from his previous vantage point. Thankfully, there was nothing on the landing with him, and his shoulders relaxed. He kept his hammer at the ready, as he headed towards the third floor amenities. There was a massive gym on one side, the wall to the hallway all glass from floor to ceiling, allowing him to look inside. There were coagulated smears of blood across the inside, making him clench his teeth a few times. There was movement inside, but with the low light and the obstructions of the machines, he couldn't tell how many were in there. You know what you gotta do, buddy, he thought urging himself forward. Pool is on that wall, so you gotta get through him. He headed for the door and opened it as quietly as he could, latching it behind him so that nothing could surprise him. 
The soft click alerted the zombies in the room, and upon closer inspection, there were three. They were all wearing mangled workout clothes, torn beaters and bloody yoga pants, spread out as if they'd been having their own undead gym class. They all began making their way towards him from their respective spots, and Kenny made a snap decision to get rid of them while they were still far enough apart. The first one was a muscle-bound zombie that looked like it had spent half its living life lifting weights. Its right arm bulged with sinew, a wet hunk of muscle hanging by a thread from a bite wound. Kenny lifted the hammer and clonked it on the head as it rounded a treadmill and waited for the body to crumble before skirting the machine and heading for the next zombie. It had once been a blonde woman, matted hair tangled up in a blood-stained headband, and it reached for him, the shirt getting caught on the side of a weight machine. Kenny swung like a baseball player, smushing her head into the heavy weight bars, corpse slumping from the pins by the fabric of its sweatshirt. The final zombie was a tall, hulking beast, staggering down the center aisle next to the cycling machines. Man, you are one big boy, Kenny said, and ran through a few plays in his head. He contemplated going for a shoulder tackle to ensure a hit to the head, but instead opted to pick up a 10-pound dumbbell and throw it. He managed to hit the thing directly in the face, knocking it back. It tripped over its own feet and came crashing down onto one of the cycling machines, head cracking against one of the support bars. Kenny jogged over and made quick work of its head, whipping around to sweep the room once more to make sure no other hulking creatures were hiding in the shadows. Once he was satisfied he was alone, he headed to the window overlooking the pool. It was a two-story drop, but this was likely as close as he was going to get. There were two zombies roaming around in the fenced-in area, but luckily not much else outside of it. He studied the window and then slung the sledgehammer back over his shoulder. He didn't want to risk getting cut by the glass, so he went back for a 20-pound dumbbell and returned, hurling it at the glass wall. The weight soared end over end through the air and crashed straight through the window, sending shards flying everywhere. As the hunks of glass settled, he stepped forward and looked through the jagged hole. The weight landed on one of the pool chairs below, narrowly missing one of the zombies looking up at him. Man, almost got a two for one there, he said, shaking his head. He sized up the pool, chewing his lip. Maybe this isn't the best idea, buddy. He scratched the back of his head and then checked his watch. The timer read 1.45, and he sighed. He was burning through time. Still got 15 blocks on the pier to get through, he thought. Don't really have time to be looking for another way. And he knew that there would be a hell of a lot more corpses to mosh through on the outside. He stared down at the pool, hyper-focused on the eight-foot deep end. Come on, buddy. This ain't no different than that time in high school when Eddie Buck jumped off his parents' house into the pool, he thought, as he bounced back and forth on the balls of his feet. Just don't pay attention to the third jump when he overshot it and broke both his heels. He did just fine the first two times. You got this. Kenny took a deep breath and a few steps back from the window. Before he could talk himself out of it, he sprinted forward and leapt. Time seemed to slow to a crawl, the air whipping past him for what felt like an eternity. His aim was true, though, and he landed in the center of the deep end, sending up a giant splash. He sank to the bottom rapidly, between his massive frame and the added weight of the hammer, and his trainers hit the pool floor with a moderate amount of force, despite the water slowing him down. He winced as his tender quad muscle sent a painful shock up his right leg. But he refused to drown in the apocalypse, in a damn pool in South Beach. He kicked hard despite the pain, and pulled himself up to breach the water. He hung in the center of the pool as the zombies shambled towards the noise. That's it, come on, he urged, and soon they splashed into the water. As soon as they hit the pool, Kenny swam to the shallow end and climbed out. He looked back, dripping wet, and saw the creatures sinking to the bottom, unable to stay afloat despite their lust for his flesh. He shook himself like a dog to get rid of the excess water 
as he hobbled over to sit on one of the pool chairs. He massaged his quad, wincing all the while. Come on now, he muttered to himself. You weren't hurt that bad before you were hitting pro receivers at full speed. You ain't gonna let a cannonball into the pool, do you in? After a few minutes of deep massage, his leg began to feel better. He knew it would be rough going, but at least he was good enough to move without limping. All right, he grunted as he got to his feet. Let's see what calamity I have to deal with next. Chapter 8 Ground Floor Kenny planted his hands on the side of the six-foot-tall concrete fence and pulled himself up a bit so that he could see across the top of it. There was a small parking lot on the other side with a handful of cars and a few dozen zombies shambling about. They were pretty spread out, despite their numbers. Okay, get over the fence, get through them, and get to the street, he thought, worrying at his lower lip. If they're that spread out, it shouldn't take me more than 10 minutes to get to the pier, even with my quad acting up. He focused on the street, but between the cars, zombies, and palm trees, he couldn't get a clear picture of what it looked like over there. Of course, if it's packed with them, I might be lunch. He swallowed hard and sighed. He shook his head. He needed to think positively, if he had any chance of getting through this. He'd come this far. He needed to get to that boat, think about cracking a beer with Captain Nico. He heaved up, pulling himself on top of the fence. He swung his legs over and then dropped down, feeling a twinge in his quad at the impact, but shaking it off. He moved quickly to the first car, ducking behind it, and then got into a crouch, ready to sprint. The closest zombie was five yards away, and he chose his path, zigzagging through them so that he could run to safety. He took off, moving quickly enough that he was able to blow by the first corpse without it even knowing he was there. He moved swiftly, cutting across to avoid the next pair of creatures. Unfortunately, with his speed and large frame, his footfalls weren't silent, and many of the zombies in the lot turned towards him, moaning loudly. He winced at the sound of their cries, especially considering a few from the street came around a beat-up sedan on the curb to see what all the fuss was about. Kenny vaulted onto the hood of the sedan, using the bumper as a springboard, and slid down the other side, hitting the grass. He tried not to look over his shoulder, hearing the groans erupting from the excited zombies that were now chasing him. He tore through some trees and the front lawn of the building, running straight towards the road. There were several zombies across the way, but only a few on the road, thankfully. He skidded to a stop on the sidewalk and looked south towards the pier. His lungs nearly collapsed at the sight. The beaches weren't the only place where it looked like spring break. There were easily hundreds of zombies stretched over the next few blocks. Probably further, but that was what he could see. And it wasn't pretty. Run, man, run, he urged himself, and broke into a sprint, or at least as good of a sprint as his leg would allow. As he approached the beginning of the next block, he knew he needed a game plan. Zombies all around him were turning towards the noise of footsteps and moaning brethren, and he knew soon they'd be densely together as they converged on him. As it was, there were still gaps between the masses of rotted flesh, still room to maneuver. He needed to get into the zone, just like when he'd return kicks on special teams. Find your lane, Kenny, and hit it hard, he thought to himself, just like when you were on the field. He darted across the intersection, cutting through several outstretched arms. Their fingertips brushed his shoulder, bouncing off the sledgehammer jiggling around on his back. Halfway across, he cut back when a wall of creatures came into his path. He lowered his shoulder and burst through two zombies by themselves, sending them tumbling back to the ground. That opened a bit of a clearing for him, and Kenny darted over to the next block. It was a little more spread out than the intersection on this stretch of road, and he pumped his legs hard sidestepping creatures as they reached out, as if he were tearing with the ball for a touchdown. At the next intersection, the wall of ghouls behind it looked impenetrable. The noise from behind him had attracted a lot of attention, it seemed, and the horde was shoulder to shoulder coming for him. He shook his head. He knew he'd never make it through. He turned to the right and tore down a side street. 
There were random smatterings of corpses in the side street, but he ducked and dodged them easily, knocking one aside with a well-placed swing of his fist. He turned down the first alley he saw, running past dumpsters and overturned trash cans. The smell wasn't great, but he welcomed the essence of garbage over the sickly decaying scent of zombie any day. When he got two buildings deep on the block, he spotted a flood of creatures coming around the corner towards him. Being between two buildings didn't give him a lot of options, so he ran back a few yards to the large dumpster outside of an Italian restaurant. He looked up and saw a fire escape ladder attached to the brick, so he pushed the large dumpster on squeaky wheels back a few feet to line it up. He clambered up on top of it and jumped up, barely able to graze the lowest rung on the ladder. Heart pounding as the zombies clustered around the dumpster, he crouched and leapt again, this time managing to wrap his hand around it. Come on, buddy, pull! He strained to haul his tired body up, legs flailing, but was finally able to get his feet up and climb the ladder. The zombies below pounded on the metal dumpster, moans of disappointment at their lost meal echoing up to him. He finally got to the roof and rolled over the edge onto the concrete top. The sun beating on it all day had made it blisteringly hot, and he hissed as he sat up, having not expected such a jolt to his skin. He looked around as he caught his breath, making sure there were no random corpses somehow stuck on the top of the building. There was none, and it seemed as if the entire block was one long stretch of connected buildings. He ran along it, hopping over short barrier walls as he went. Before long, he reached the next intersection, and he rubbed his forehead at the sight. It was thick with zombies below, like a living carpet of death. He took a seat on the edge of the building, breathing heavily. Getting closer, he muttered. Only 13 blocks to go. He studied the area, desperate to figure out how he was going to be able to land on the ground, let alone get across. From his vantage point, he could see several blocks ahead, and it was nothing but wall-to-wall -wall zombies with very little room to maneuver. As he surveyed the landscape, his eyes focused in on the store across the side street, mere yards from his current position. It was a giant tourist trap surf shop, filled with crappy iron-on t-shirts that said South Beach and the occasional dirty double entendre. While he would typically never give one of those stores a second look, he remembered doing a signing in one of them during his rookie year. They were huge, ran half a block, and typically shared warehouse space in the back with the other half of the block, because the same people that specialized in novelties owned it as well. If I can get in on this side, I can kick off another block, he mused. Not perfect, but it's better than what I'm dealing with now. He looked at the road below, and it was thick with corpses. He screwed his fists into his eyes with a sigh. Even if that does get me to the next block, how am I gonna get to the store? He turned around, surveying the roof for anything useful. There was a small metal vent cover, one of those rounded types that made it harder for the wind to knock it over. He headed over and took off his sledgehammer, lining up a shot as if he were playing golf. He bonked the cover, and it popped off easily. He set the hammer down, and then picked up the big metal cover. Gotta see if I remember the hammer toss from my track days, he thought, and headed back to the corner of the building. He took a few steps back from the edge, and began to spin around, the cover in one hand. He built up a lot of momentum, and then let it fly. The shiny projectile soared through the air, reaching the far end of the intersection. It smashed into the ground, and generated a loud metallic racket, reverberating through the space like a shockwave. The zombies immediately began shambling in that direction, riled up and excited. Kenny ducked out of sight, and headed back to pick up his sledgehammer. He slung it over his shoulder, and took a seat to catch his breath. Give this thing a few minutes, and I should be good to go. Chapter 9. Thirteen blocks until the pier. One twenty left on the clock. Kenny strained his ears as the horde moved away from his hiding spot on the roof. He looked at his watch and took note of the timer. Halftime break is over, buddy, he thought. You need to get your ass in gear. He got to his feet, but stayed low, inching to the side of the building. 
His distraction had paid dividends, as the crowd just beneath him was pretty spread out, while across the intersection a huge mass of bodies congregated. He moved to the back of the building, where a rusted ladder was attached to the corner. He looked down, and there was nothing in the back alley. He began to climb down, carefully and silently, hanging from the bottom and dropping the final few feet to the ground. His quad screamed again, and he knelt to give it a quick rub to calm it down. After a moment, he inched to the edge of the building, looking out at the cross street, eyeing the giant plate glass window to the store. There was a tall zombie standing close to it, seemingly mesmerized by its reflection in the window. Kenny pulled out his sledgehammer again and readied it, sprinting out from behind cover and across the street. His footsteps drew the attention of several onlookers, but he was past them before they could even react. The large zombie by the window had just enough time to turn around before getting a hammer in the chest. Kenny thrust forward as hard as he could, and the corpse went flying back, crashing through the window as its body weight, combined with the force of the thrust, smashed the glass. The noise attracted the distracted zombies across the street, who immediately began pursuit. He jumped into the store and over the downed corpse, who was able to reach up and clip the football player's back foot as he leapt. Kenny tumbled to the ground, his hammer sliding across the floor. He scrambled to get back to his feet, scrabbling for his hammer that had slid into the middle of the main showroom floor. Fuck, these things are everywhere. Moans and footsteps echoed from inside, all around him. There were ten aisles that covered the back half of the store, and a number of large round t-shirt racks just in front of them. Zombies converged from everywhere, and he grabbed his hammer and ducked inside one of the t-shirt racks. He curled up and stayed as silent as he could, watching the floor beneath the bottom hems of the shirts. He turned towards the back of the store, looking through the legs of a nearby ghoul. Once the last few headed for the window, he'd have a clear shot to the back. He bided his time, fighting the urge to just go as the moans grew louder from outside. Wait for your moment, buddy, he thought to himself. You go too early, you get tackled. The clear sound of footsteps on broken glass snapped him to attention. And if you go too late, you're really gonna get tackled, he argued with himself. Dozens of footsteps and a chorus of moans erupted at the front of the store, and he knew his time was running out. The last two zombies from the aisles moved around the rack, but he noticed that instead of moving all the way around, several of them stopped, stuck on the sides. He turned his head and saw that the horde from outside had reached the rack, creating a corpse traffic jam. Time to go. He leapt from his hiding spot, darting straight to the back of the store, leaving t-shirts fluttering in his wake. The zombies nearest his rack reacted slowly, turning around at the sound of his footsteps, but only able to see him round the corner at the end of the aisle. He reached the back double doors that led to the storeroom and pushed one of the swinging doors open a crack, noting the few creatures back there. He readied his sledgehammer and leapt through, rushing straight up to the closest one. He swung at it, and the zombie's face took the full force of the blow, sending its head flying from its shoulders. The other zombie, five yards away, reached out and began stumbling towards him, but he sidestepped it and kept moving. The storeroom was huge, at least 15 feet wide, and running the entire length of the building. As he came around the edge of a stack of crates, he took in the full room, and his heart sank. There were a few dozen zombies easily inside, thanks to one large bay door at the far end that had been left open. More were outside, staggering back and forth in front of it, and a few of the corpses inside were wandering out into the sun. Kenny knew he had no time to waste, considering the force coming behind him from the front of the tourist shop. Kenny started running, not able to be at full speed given the shocks in his quad, but faster than most regular humans. Instead of direct confrontation to waste time, he avoided the zombies where he could as he approached the bay door, knocking aside any that were too close. A skinny zombie stood at the doorframe and turned towards him as he approached. He fainted left and then grabbed the ghoul by the collar and threw it to the ground. He dove outside and looked down the alley, seeing a flood of creatures blocking his path. To the other store, 
He shook his head and darted back inside, ducking underneath a few outstretched hands, and tore for the other business. There was another set of double doors ahead, the same swinging type that opened in both directions. He shoved past two zombies and burst into the doors, but they didn't give. He bounced off of it and fell back into the warehouse, his hammer clattering to the floor in the process. The two nearby zombies turned and grabbed for him. One managed to get a hold of his arm, and Kenny wrenched himself away so hard that he heard rotted bones cracking. He quickly grabbed the arm and spun, throwing the zombie into the other one, like a wrestler throwing an opponent into the ropes. The two cracked heads and tumbled to the ground in a heap of sick flesh. Kenny grabbed his hammer and pressed his shoulder into the doors. They cracked just enough that he could see a heavy desk pressed up against the other side. Someone had tried to block this entrance. He glanced over his shoulder to see a throng of creatures coming his way, closing the distance between them and him. The head knocker zombies struggled to get up and seemed to be making headway. Push, man, push, he grunted to himself and then let out a scream as he pushed as hard as he could. The desk on the other side squeaked as it ground across the floor, and the zombies continued to close the distance, now just five yards away. The groans were deafening, there were so many of them. Kenny gave another great heave, grunting with the effort, and managed to open up a gap between the doors that he could squeeze through. He tossed the hammer inside and wriggled his way through head first kicking as he felt zombie hands grasping at his ankles. Get off me, he screamed, kicking and thrashing enough that he was able to slide through the door and onto the desk. He quickly rolled off and then pressed his back up against the desk, jamming it back up against the doors. The metal monstrosity looked like it was from the 60s and appeared to be made entirely out of solid steel. With the door secure, he huffed and puffed for a moment, before looking around with wide eyes. He had no time to rest. He had to make sure he was alone in here. He grabbed his hammer and started walking around the darkened store. Knickknacks adorned the shelves, tacky even by South Florida standards. He shook his head and kept sweeping the aisles, hearing nothing but the banging coming from the warehouse. He finally cleared the aisles, seeing no movement. However, he paused on the last corridor, when he looked up to the front cash registers and noticed a few bodies on the ground. He moved forward cautiously, keeping a close eye on them in case they were attracted by his footsteps. However, even as he approached, they didn't move. As he got close enough to see, he recoiled at the sight in front of him. It was a young couple, maybe even in their late teens, lying dead with a shotgun beside them. The top half of the woman's head had been blown clean off, while the young man had opted for a shot underneath the chin. Blood and brain matter coated the walls above them. Kenny took a knee beside them, putting a hand over his mouth for a moment, and then lowering it. I'm sorry y'all had to do this, he said quietly. Not fair to have kids resorting to this. In a just world, you'd be out there enjoying the sun and the sand. Instead, you're here, and I'm surrounded by ghouls that want to eat me. He took a deep breath and then reached for the shotgun, disentangling it from the dead boy's fingers. I apologize for this. He stood up, and the boy's head fell slumped onto the young girl's shoulder, the two of them resting forever together. Kenny shook his head again and turned away, inspecting the weapon. It was a double-barrel shotgun, and it was empty. He considered patting the kids down for shells, but the reality was that the gun wasn't really practical for the crowd he was facing anyway. He tossed it aside. You know, buddy, you do have a gun of your own, he thought, and then put a hand to his forehead. He couldn't believe he hadn't drawn the damn thing all day. He supposed it was a byproduct of rarely ever firing a gun, and really not at all since he'd gone shooting with his dad in high school. He pulled the Desert Eagle from its holster and gave it a once-over, chuckling to himself at the gaudy nature of it. If I die, I'd better not die with this thing in my hands, he muttered. Don't want some future archaeologist finding me and coming up with some crazy story about my lifestyle after all. He holstered the gun and made sure his hammer was secure before creeping to the window. He stayed ducked down and out of sight. As he peeked over the sill, 
he saw that his toss of the vent had done more than pull zombies just from the side street. It pulled a lot of them from the next few blocks. Don't really have a plan past these two blocks, but ten blocks away sounds a hell of a lot better than twelve, he thought. Chapter 10 Twelve Blocks Until the Pier Kenny looked at his watch, one hour until his ride left, leaving him high and dry to die. Gotta move, man, he thought frantically. Twelve blocks in an hour and a pier run was a lot easier a few weeks ago. He got up from his spot, creeping to the front door and gently turning the lock into an open position. He made sure his sledgehammer was secure over his shoulder and readied the handgun. They're gonna come after me as soon as I start shooting anyway. Might as well get some use out of this thing. He pulled the slide back, making sure there was a round in the chamber before taking a deep breath and wrapping his free hand around the doorknob. He opened it quietly and surveyed his surroundings. There were a hundred or so zombies spread out over the next couple of blocks, with enough paths to zigzag through. He took off, his leg already burning, the injured quad feeling like it might explode at any second. He wanted to run faster, but he knew that if he pushed it and blew the muscle again, that he would be completely stuck. Slow and steady won the race, as they said, but they probably didn't take into account that the end of the race was the only way out of a zombie-infested city. Dodging was a little more difficult than it would have been at full speed, but he breathed through it and managed, narrowly ducking outstretched arms and wide-open mouths. Halfway down the block, one ghoul was a lot quicker than the others and latched onto his forearm. He didn't quite have the spring in his step to wrench free, and it pulled him close. He yanked hard, but the creature had a rigor mortis strong grip. It was time. Kenny raised the gun and fired into its forehead at point blank range. The corpse crumpled to the ground, dead hand attempting to take him with it. He finally jerked free, but the delay in him freeing himself coupled with the loud noise gave the other nearby ghouls a chance to close in on him. He ran as hard as he could down the rest of the block to the next intersection huffing through the pain in his leg. Thankfully, the next block was fairly sparse, so he pressed on, slowing just enough to ease the strain in his quad a bit, but still be able to dodge the undead. He didn't think he'd be so lucky if he had to fire his gun from a standstill a second time. Two zombies blocked his path with narrow gaps on either side, where a wall of creatures had begun to form, pouring out of side streets and alleys. He knew he didn't have the speed to get around them, but they needed to be out of the way quickly. He aimed his gun and fired as he ran, and the shot went completely wild. His heart skipped a beat, and then thumped in fear, and he began firing rapidly in his panic. After six shots in the span of two seconds, he miraculously found the target on both of the zombies and hopped the crumpled corpses. He wasn't proud of wasting ammo nor making so much noise, but he had to press on. His quad ached worse than ever before, but he pushed himself before the horde could swallow him up. At the next intersection, his throat tightened at the sight of what he'd feared the most on this trip, a solid wall of zombies about half a block up. Without time to think, he hung a left and tore towards the beach. The side street was mostly clear, giving him a free pass to the boardwalk. As the beach came into view, it was as breathtaking as the first time he'd laid eyes on it. Gorgeous white sand, the sun reflecting off of the water. And unlike the first time he'd laid eyes on it, a few thousand zombies between him and the pier. Rather than run on the sand, he stayed on the boardwalk, jogging through dining areas and outdoor bars. The undead were few and far between there, since most of the businesses had their own roped off areas that he could hop and they couldn't. This changed, of course, when he got to the end of the block, and there were a cluster of zombies in the beach access area. Kenny leapt over the rope, landing first on his good leg, and fired at a straggler that was too close for comfort, dropping it. A dozen other creatures within 15 yards converged on him, and he fired wildly in the direction he was running, striking two in the chest, and then finally one in the head, giving him a bit of an escape hatch. He rushed through the hole to the next block of shops. 
Again, the zombies weren't in the restaurant areas, giving Kenny a blissful free pass on the block. However, as he approached the end, the next beach access was a lot more packed than the last. He skidded to a stop and looked around for an idea of anywhere, anything to help him, and saw a pizza restaurant with an open bay door. He quickly darted in and did a quick sweep of the place, finding nothing inside. He ducked behind the counter, but kept his head up to watch the front. His quad was on fire, and he hissed as he stretched out and massaged it a bit. Eight more blocks, buddy, he thought as he rubbed his leg. Eight more blocks, you got this. He checked his watch. 45 minutes left. Getting real close to the fourth quarter there. This is your time to shine. You always knocked it out in crunch time. That's why you went in the first round of the draft. He chewed his lower lip, closing his eyes for a moment, and then shook his head. Yeah, man, just think of all them boys from back home who never thought you'd amount to anything. Where are they now? They probably out there like those beachgoers, wandering aimlessly in search of their next meal. He let go of his leg to check his gun and reloaded it, tossing the spent magazine to the side. There was no point weighing himself down anymore. It was unlikely he'd ever use that clip again. He resumed a quick rub of his sore leg, the muscles finally starting to relax a little. Okay, enough of this, he thought, and got to his feet. Fourth quarter is kicking off, and you need to figure out what the hell you're gonna do. Chapter 11, Eight Blocks Until the Pier. Kenny did one more stretch to make sure his quad was loosened up for the next chunk of his path. He took a deep breath, feeling good about his strength for the next leg of his race, and headed to the front of the store to take stock of the situation. He looked ahead to the beach and towards the pier, pursing his lips at the view of easily a thousand zombies pretty tight together. Not the best option there. He turned to peer down the boardwalk, seeing dozens at the far end looking in his direction. They were stuck behind a waist-high fence at the fancy restaurant on the corner. Well, you can take your chances on the beach, he thought with a grimace. Or you hope those boys at the end are okay with your crowd surfing. He glanced back the way he'd come. Or you can backtrack and hope the street is clear, which is about as likely as your crowd surfing idea working. He looked at his watch. 42 minutes until the ship set sail for good. He clicked his teeth together a few times, clenching and unclenching his fist. Gotta keep pushing forward, but how? A gust of wind picked up, and a closed table umbrella clanged against the metal table. He looked at it as it rattled about, noting its seven-foot-wide wingspan. He headed over, feeling the canvas material, and opening it up to see that the struts beneath were metal. He glanced at the zombies, and then back at the umbrella. This just might be crazy enough to work. He chuckled at the image in his head of a king-sized Mary Poppins with the giant thing. He picked it up, a heavy beast with a shaft of steel, carrying it under his arm to the pretentious restaurant on the corner. Sorry, y'all, I'm gonna have to ask you to step back a bit, he declared in his best bouncer voice, and used the tip of the umbrella to shove a few zombies back, giving him room to operate. Once he was able to get the front on the other side, he slid the center mechanism to open it up, creating what was effectively a steel-reinforced barrier seven feet wide. He pulled it back so that the edges rested against the fence, and nothing could get through it. He shook his head and readied himself to go. Of all the whacked out ideas you've had in your life, this one is certainly up there. He shoved forward and leapt over the fence in one go, pushing the horde back. He pumped his legs hard, parting the sea of zombies. Some of them bowled completely over, flopping around like fish as they attempted to get back to their feet. With the umbrella under one arm like a jousting lance, he pulled the handgun with his free hand and aimed as best he could, firing at one of the fallen zombies lunging for him from behind. The first bullet found its target, but when he fired at a second one, he missed. He cursed, aimed and fired again, striking it down. He quickly holstered the gun and started pushing again, until the metal tip clanged against the metal of the next restaurant fence. 
he quickly swung the umbrella from side to side, knocking the ghouls back before flipping it over his head and rushing forward. There was one lone zombie that had survived the wriggling canvas, so he lowered his shoulder and tackled it over the fence. They hit the ground hard, Kenny landing awkwardly on his shoulder. He let out a grunt, hoping it was just bruised and not separated. The zombie rolled over and reached for him, opening its rotted mouth in hunger. Kenny drew his gun, put it to the corpse's head and fired. He kicked away from the fence, out of the reach of the hungry zombies trying to grab a snack between the rungs. Once clear, he relaxed on his back for a moment to catch his breath. Kinda surprised I made that one, he huffed and laughed to himself. The umbrella was stupid. He was fortunate he was alive. How many times was he going to feel that way today? Or for the rest of the apocalypse? He got to his feet with a grunt and holstered his gun, walking along the boardwalk, rubbing his shoulder. Thankfully, it was just dinged up a little and not dislocated. The path was clear through the next block, and miraculously, the next beach access crossing. He took a deep breath and quickened his pace to a jog. Chapter 12, Six Blocks Until the Pier. Kenny checked his watch, 30 minutes left until his ride would sail off, leaving him stranded with a thousand hungry zombies. He took a knee just outside of a restaurant door, looking out at the ocean. There was a boat on the horizon. He assumed that was his ride. He looked at the beach, at the masses of rotted bodies on the sand, as well as in the surf. Come on now, buddy, don't be thinking about that, he urged silently. Even if you did make it past those beach bums, there's gonna be a lot of them in the water, including under it. You weren't the best swimmer to begin with, let alone when something is trying to pull you under. He looked out towards the boat again and noticed a lifeguard station on the next block, about 30 yards into the sand. It was a big red building on stilts, with a ramp that had a 90 degree turn in it to reach the cabin entrance. Beneath was a shiny jet black four-wheeler. Man, would be nice to hop on that thing, he thought, eyes going starry with the fantasy. I'd be at the pier in no time. He looked at his watch again, 29 minutes. Buddy, you're gonna have to take a chance, either swimming in those things or hoping that the keys to that ride are in that building. He chewed his lip for a moment and then checked his handgun. The magazine was three quarters full. As he put it away, he studied his route like he was studying a punt return, figuring his path forward. Get moving, man, time is short. He grunted and burst from his hiding spot like an Olympic runner, hopping the fence beside the restaurant and straight into the beach access area. His feet hitting the wood alerted a few zombies on the beach, and they turned, moaning in his direction. He ignored them as he hit the sand, forcing him to pump his legs harder on the unstable ground. His quad screamed as he moved past them and tore down the coast, there were easily a hundred zombies standing between him and the lifeguard tower, but they were spread out fairly well. While the sand was difficult for him to run on, it was also difficult for the creatures, and they moved slowly, sometimes falling flat on their faces as they turned. The fallen ones managed to trip up their excited brethren, and any that managed to stagger into his path, he simply dropped his good shoulder and checked them in the chest, sending them back and out of the way. Check the four-wheeler first, he thought as he kept his eye on the prize. Maybe they left the key in the ignition. He ran beneath the raised building and straight towards the vehicle. He slowed down and cautiously skirted it, gun drawn just in case there was a hidden threat. When there was no ghoul there waiting to jump out and attack his face, he holstered the weapon and checked over the vehicle. There was no key. Yeah, that would have been too easy, right? He muttered and turned to jog back out from under the structure. Hundreds of zombies shambled towards him in the sand, and he tore for the ramp, hitting it hard. There were two zombies there between him and the guard tower, and they turned at the first sound of his trainers hitting wood. He rushed them, getting in between the two and driving them both into the railing with his monstrous arms. He flexed as hard as he could, flipping them both over the side. They landed on a handful of zombies below, 
toppling them all over into a heap on the beach. He rushed up the rest of the ramp to the door, shoving it open as he reached it. As he stepped inside, two shirtless lifeguard zombies staggered towards him from the other side of the small room. He drew his gun and aimed carefully, squeezing the trigger. The first bullet hit one of them in the throat, and he cursed, adjusting slightly to fire again, dropping one. He knew his ammo was running low, so he walked right up to the second one and fired into its forehead at point-blank range. As the body crumpled to the ground, footsteps echoed on the ramp, and Kenny's breath quickened with panic. He rushed back to the door and slammed it shut, grabbing a nearby desk and shoving it against the frame, hoping that would buy him some time. Keys, man, find the keys, he urged himself and began to tear the room apart. He looked on top of desks, in drawers, on shelves. He threw papers to the ground in frustration, tearing towels and equipment down from the hooks along the wall. After a minute or so, he growled and then turned to the two unmoving bodies. He sighed. You know what you gotta do. He knelt beside the closest one and went through the pockets of its standard issue bathing suit. He winced as the putrid flesh cracked at the light pressure of him rummaging. There was nothing in the pockets there, so he moved to the other one and tried there. As he dug his hand into the second body's pocket, he turned his head away to try to give his nose a break from the rotted smell, and then noticed a small hook on the wall with a little neon yellow posted above it. Scrawled across it in blue pen were the words, four-wheeler. He let out a defeated sigh before removing his hand from the pocket and wiping it furiously on his pants. Not a surprise given how this day is going. He went over to the hook and grabbed the key ring from the hook, gripping it tight. He jumped as loud banging began on the door, signaling the zombies had reached the top of the ramp. Kenny ran to the window facing the boardwalk, pushing open the wooden shutter. He looked out, staring down at easily 80 zombies standing directly below him. Hoping for a better result, he headed to the beachside opening, throwing it open to reveal dozens of zombies there and hundreds more coming. He stepped back into the center of the room, pressing his fists into his temples. He looked at his watch again, 22 minutes. Cutting this way too close, man, he groaned, rubbing his forehead. Way too close. He looked around the room frantically for anything that might help him escape. After checking over staplers, a printer, a laptop, and a beaded bracelet reading Claire, he found a walkie-talkie. Now we're cooking, he murmured hopefully. He picked it up and flipped it on, relieved that the battery still worked. He fiddled around with the knobs on the top, finally finding a way for it to emit a high-pitched tone. He winced as he turned it to full volume and quickly ran to the boardwalk side opening. He reeled back, and then hucked it as hard as he could down the beach, away from the pier. He stepped back from the window, moving to the side so he could see out, but the zombies wouldn't be able to see him. Come on, move, he urged under his breath. Go get that thing. The majority of the zombies on that side were attracted to the noise and began to wander off towards it. He gave it a few minutes, watching as dozens of them moved away from the opening. He checked his watch again, 19 minutes. He looked over the edge again, six zombies below. No choice, man, you gotta go. He holstered his gun and pulled the sledgehammer from his back. He slipped the key ring onto his ring finger to keep them safe as he gripped the hammer tight. He leapt from the window, plummeting eight feet to the ground. He landed just on the far side of the zombies in the sand and ignored the stinging in his quad immediately whipping around to swing hard. He caught the rightmost zombie in the ribcage and drove it into the others, setting off a domino effect. Half of them hit the ground immediately, the other three staggering backwards. Kenny rushed beneath the building and hopped on the four-wheeler, slinging the hammer back on his shoulder in a fluid motion. He put the key in and turned the ignition, hitting the starter. The sound of the vehicle springing to life was like a breath of air after a near drowning. Just as he hit the throttle, a zombie reached for him, catching its arm in the sledgehammer. 
It pulled Kenny back just enough that he flipped back off of the vehicle, the four-wheeler rolling forward several yards by itself. He hit the sand, knocking some of the air from his lungs as he landed on the hammer itself. The zombie reached for him, but he quickly rolled onto his stomach out of reach. He staggered to his feet, fumbling for the gun, and shot the hungry asshole ghoul in the face. The noise had attracted some of the mob back, and they converged within a few yards of him. Kenny quickly took off running as fast as he could towards the vehicle. He bum-rushed a shoulder hit to knock a straggler zombie out of the way, and he hopped back into the four-wheeler and hit the throttle, holding on tight this time. It lurched forward, slamming into several creatures in front of it, knocking them to the side. Kenny sped up the beach, putting a little bit of distance between him and the horde at the guard shack. However, after a few more blocks, he looked towards the pier and slammed on the brakes. There was a wall of creatures between him and his destination, with virtually no gaps between them. Fuck, he groaned. Only three blocks away and no clear path. He looked back towards the boardwalk, seeing only a relative handful of zombies in the beach access area, with the streets sparsely populated, at least up to the intersection. The pier park entrance is only a few blocks up and over, he thought frantically. Longer drive, but this thing should move better on roads. He checked his watch. Thirteen minutes left on the timer. Let's do it. He made the turn and hit the throttle, speeding off towards the road, heart pounding in his ears. Chapter 13. Three Blocks Until the Pier. Kenny sped off the beach, ramming into a few zombies as he blew by them to get onto the road. He approached the first intersection, where there were dozens milling about, slowly turning towards him as he revved the engine. As he blew through the intersection, knocking creatures down as he went, he glanced to the side and noticed the road thick with rotted bodies. He sped ahead on the side street, which was less densely populated, but he still had to be careful that he didn't get knocked off by any outstretched arms. The next two blocks went quickly, and he made a hard left turn to head for the pier park. He sped ahead, weaving in and out of zombie traffic, like a sports car on a freeway. With a block to go, he sat up a little straighter to get a good view of the park. There was a jam of busted vehicles at the entrance, completely blocking it off. Gonna have to run up the side street to get close to the pier, he thought, and kicked down a little to approach the entrance. He prepared to turn towards the beach and move closer before hopping the fence into the park, but his plan fell to pieces when he saw yet another wall of corpses a block down from the entrance. He shook his head and sighed. This is what I get for living in a tourist destination, he muttered. He hit the brakes and hopped off of the four-wheeler, running over to the wrecked vehicles blocking off the entrance. He hopped up onto the hood of one of the crashed cars, looking into the parking lot and noting several zombies milling about. He checked his watch. Nine minutes to go. Hope Nico isn't taken off early. Without any time to waste, he hopped down and made a run for the pier. It would be a three-block trip through the park, with God only knew how many creatures in his path. He pulled his sledgehammer from his back as he moved, holding it in one hand as he tore down the paved pathways weaving through shade trees. Dozens of zombies milled about, but thankfully the fences had kept out large numbers, coupled with the dead cars at the gate. Two more blocks. He stayed focused, running straight ahead, eye on the prize. Once he emerged from the wooded area of the park, he came to a big field, and relief soared in his chest at the sight of only a handful of creatures. His quad zinged, and he stopped for a moment to rub it frantically. Come on now, he whispered. We ain't going through all this and coming this close and crapping out. You can rest on the boat. His leg relaxed and he glanced at his watch. Six minutes left. He let out a huff and pressed on, managing to avoid the zombies in the field with relative ease. He could see the beginning of the pier now, and there was a pack of ten zombies standing between him and his escape. Made it this far, y'all ain't stopping me, 
he grunted and gripped the hammer with both hands. He tore forward, and the zombies turned towards him like a living wall, not giving him any lanes to dart through. At the five-yard line, he stopped abruptly and threw the hammer with all of his might. The heavy tool flipped through the air, crashing into the chest of the center zombie and sending it flying back into the ground. Kenny's trusty hammer bounced to the grass on the other side of it, and he took off, right for the hole he'd made, just like a running back. The zombies to either side reached out, but their grasps were weak and didn't stop him. He broke through their arms and leapt over the fallen corpse, swooping down to grab his hammer as he went. As his foot hit the front edge of the pier, and the waves crashed against the wood, his heart seemed to explode in his chest with something he hadn't felt since the beginning of the apocalypse, hope. He ran along the nearly hundred yard long pier, and his leg screamed, his quad nearly giving right out. He fell to a knee, bracing himself on the hammer. Fight through it, buddy, he urged himself through gritted teeth. You almost there. He pushed himself up with the hammer and peeled himself off of the ground, jogging ahead. The pier was dotted with zombies, all of them focused on him now and heading his way. Thankfully, the wood was about 15 feet wide, so he had a little room to maneuver. The first zombie reached for him, skin peeling almost completely off from baking in the South Florida sun for weeks. Kenny attempted to dart around it, but his leg was not having any fancy movement. Gonna be like that, is it? He grunted through the pain. All right. He swung the hammer across, cracking the beast in the side of the head. With one out of the way, he continued his jog, the next duo of corpses waiting for him. Come on, he bellowed, blood pumping in his frenzy. Who else wants some of Kenny Morris, huh? Bring it. He hobbled up the pier, swinging his hammer like a madman. He cracked skulls, took out legs, shoved them clear off of the railing into the jagged rocks below. With each hit, he let out a yell, partially to psych himself up and keep moving, and partially to try to let out his frustrations about how this day was going. Weeks of being trapped inside, and a full day of being battered and bruised from fighting these damn things, bubbled up in his gut like fire, and he unleashed it like a dragon. At the end of the pier, there were eight zombies remaining. He glanced back over his shoulder to appraise the path of destruction he'd left behind, a small horde of zombies pouring onto the pier behind him from the beach. Last drive of the game, buddy, he huffed. You're in control. Just gotta finish off a couple more plays and you'll be home free. He yelled and hobbled towards the final corpses. He swung the hammer like Thor, crushing bones and cracking heads with mighty strength. Creatures stepped up, one by one, to get smacked down one by one. As Kenny reached the last creature, his chest heaved, the totality of the day catching up to him. He faced off against the tall, heavyset zombie in tattered jeans and a bloody polo shirt, lunging forward to shoulder strike it in the chest. He stood over the fallen ghoul and delivered the final blow, bringing his trusty sledgehammer down, exploding brains and coagulated blood all over the wood beneath. Kenny breathed heavy, his killing finally done for the day, he remained motionless aside from the hard breathing, letting the fury-induced spree subside, flow out of him, centering himself. He looked at his watch. Two minutes to spare. Nothing like cutting it close, huh? He turned towards the end of the pier, connected to a long reef of rocks that stretched out another 150 yards into the ocean. It was well past the low-lying areas, so the threat of undersea ghouls was minimal. As he approached the railing, the boat in the distance began to move. Hey, Nico, he yelled, throwing his arms in the air. Don't you dare leave me, I'm here. He jumped the railing and moved across the jagged rocks as best he could. He had to be careful, as one slip and all of this would have been for nothing. Nico, he screamed. I made it, wait. The boat seemed to pick up speed and his heart thumped with panic. In a light bulb moment, he drew his handgun and fired the rest of his clip into the air. Four shots rang out, and he stood on a rock, 
the golden weapon glinting in the sun high above his head. The boat began to turn. Thank God, he breathed, and continued to move along the rocks, much less panicked this time. Finally, he made it to the end, about 30 yards away from the boat. He patted the chain of his hammer. Don't you go pulling me under now, he said, and then holstered his gun, diving into the water. Chapter 14, SS Live in the Dream. It was an almost comical belly flop, given the weight on his back. He pumped his arms and legs hard, keeping his head up despite the hammer trying to drag him down. The water was cool and welcome on his hot skin, soothing his tired body. As he approached the boat, an orange blur flew past his face. He sucked in a deep lungful of air and dove for the round life preserver, hooking his arm around it with a death grip. Don't give up on me, my friend. You have made it, Nico bellowed from above, reeling in the final distance between them. He lowered the ladder and helped Kenny up, and as soon as the soaking wet football player crossed the threshold, he collapsed onto the deck, gasping for breath. Are you okay, my friend? Nico leaned down, brow furrowed. Kenny rolled to look up at him, a tall, older gentleman with the wildest gray hair he'd ever seen. He raised a lone finger as he caught his breath, and the captain nodded, leaning back against the deck to wait. Kenny finally sat up, pulling the sledgehammer from his back, patting it affectionately before resting his arms on his knees. You must be Captain Nico. That I am, Mr. Kenny Morris, Nico replied with a big grin. I am so glad you have made it to my vessel. The younger man let out an exasperated laugh. That makes two of us, he replied, still huffing. The captain leaned over, eyeing the hammer. You know, my friend, I may not be the smartest man on this earth, even with the drastic reduction in people, he began thoughtfully. But even I know that swimming with a sledgehammer on your back tends to make it a more difficult exercise. You are correct, Captain, Kenny replied, offering a smile. That was one of the more difficult things I've done today, but this baby took me through thick and thin today. He patted the business end of the hammer again. I wasn't about to leave her behind, especially since we don't know what else we're going to encounter. Nico wagged a finger at him. This is very true, my friend, he replied. But I have to ask, if this wasn't the most difficult thing you've done today, what was? Patio jumping, Kenny replied. The captain blinked at him. Patio jumping. He suddenly burst into a fit of laughter, holding his belly. When he caught his breath, he continued, oh, my friend, you Americans are my favorite people. Difficult patio jumping. Back in my country, this was something my friends and I would do to pass the time on the weekends. Were you 23 floors up at the time? The younger man asked innocently. Nico's laughter died on his lips, and his eyes widened. You jumped across a patio 23 floors up? Yep, Kenny replied with a firm nod and then jumped from the 23rd to the 22nd floor. The captain shook his head, rubbing his forehead. Oh, Mr. Kenny Morris, you are one hell of a wild man, he said with a chuckle. We are going to have an adventure together, of this I have no doubt. He held up a finger and then disappeared into the small cabin. There were noises of rubbing before he emerged holding two cold bottles of beer, holding one out. Come, we must celebrate, my friend for your triumph over those who wish to do you harm, and to properly kick off our newfound friendship. Kenny took the frosty bottle, despite never being a big drinker in his time. After the day he'd had, he couldn't help but savor a long sip of the icy brew. Nico tipped his head back and opened his throat, downing the entire bottle in one go. Impressive, Captain, Kenny said with raised eyebrows. Nico grinned. I've been training since childhood, he replied. Come, my friend, we will have plenty of time to talk, but we must get moving. Sure, but may I ask a favor? The younger man asked. The captain nodded. Of course, what can I do for you? May I borrow your radio? Kenny asked. I have a worried friend of mine that I need to let know I've made it. 
Nico motioned to the door. Of course, down in the cabin on the table. And if you need another drink, please be my guest. Thanks, but I don't want to drain your supply. The younger man replied with a wink and saluted him with the bottle. Kenny turned and headed down the small staircase into the cabin, smiling and shaking his head. There were easily a hundred cases of alcohol packed into that tiny room. If he were to venture a guess, he'd say that his new friend had robbed a liquor store before setting sail. This is gonna be fun, he thought, and limped through the cramped quarters to the corner. There was a folding table with a ham radio set up, and he plonked himself down on the little stool before punching in Arnold's frequency. Hey, Arnold, it's your boy Kenny, he said into the microphone. You around? There was a moment of silence before his friend's eager voice came back. Oh my God, Kenny, I was getting worried, Arnold gushed. How long does it take you to go a few blocks away from your apartment building? Kenny laughed. Man, you know how tourist towns are, just way too many people. Makes it hard to move about. Man, I am so glad you made it safe, his friend replied, sincerely this time. Did you have any trouble? Kenny glanced down at his seized quad. I'm a little dinged up, but nothing a little time won't fix, he admitted. Did have to go a little daredevil, though. Daredevil, huh? Arnold asked. Yeah, you know, stunt riding a four-wheeler, leaping off of tall buildings, Kenny replied casually. You know, just your average day in the zombie apocalypse. His friend chuckled. And what about your rescuer, he asked. They seem like good people. I mean, he could have left me stranded here, Kenny replied. But instead he pulled me aboard and handed me a beer. Arnold let out a noise of approval. Hell, the only way that could improve was if he were a bikini model. There was a female voice in the background muttering, and his voice went a little quieter, as if he turned away from the mic. I mean, better for him, woman. You know I'm content with you. I, I mean, happy with you. Kenny snorted a laugh. Sorry about that, Arnold said into the microphone. His friend shook his head. Hope you got a comfortable couch. Yeah, we do, Arnold replied with a sigh. Really thankful I sprung for the good material on that one. The boat lurched and began to move, picking up speed slowly. Well, listen, man, we're getting underway here, so I'm gonna go join the captain out on deck, Kenny said. You make sure you all stay safe. You know it, Arnold replied. Kenny leaned forward. And if you don't mind, can you let the others know I made it out safe? Might be a while before I'm back on. You got it, man, his friend assured him. Don't be a stranger now. Kenny smiled. Wouldn't dream of it. He flicked off the radio, replacing the microphone. He stood and hobbled his way back up to the deck, just as the boat hit its top speed. Did you reach your friend? Nico asked. The younger man nodded and saluted with his beer. I did, thank you very much. Please, anytime you need to contact them, you feel free, the captain assured him. My home is your home now. Kenny nodded and leaned against the side of the boat. Again, I really appreciate it. My friends would never forgive me if I didn't offer this to the great Kenny Morris, Nico announced, waving his hand in the air. The younger man chuckled and shook his head. So, he said, where are we headed? There is a fuel depot a couple of hours up that should be pretty abandoned, the captain explained. A friend of mine owned the dock, and it was private and secluded. Kenny nodded. Sounds good to me, he replied. And do we have a final destination in mind? Hilton Head Island in South Carolina, Nico declared. The younger man chewed this over. Hilton Head, huh? He asked, rubbing his chin. One of our assistant coaches spent time out there, really enjoyed the golfing. It sounds like a great place, but why there? A friend of mine contacted me, said that the island was an impenetrable fortress, Nico explained. Only one bridge in and out of town, and they claim it's secure. He held up a closed fist in victory. Well, it can't be any worse than Miami, so I'm all in, Kenny replied, and turned to look back as his condo in the sky grew smaller on the horizon, 
the boat leaving the smoking city behind. He raised his beer at the luck of still having a chance of surviving the end of the world. Full steam ahead, Captain. End of book four. Up next, the action goes back to Portland as Zion and Calvin investigate a cry for help in Portland, part three. <laughs>